modern art. It sells for a fortune in exclusive galleries, but what's it ever done for us? Has it influenced the clothes that we wear, or the buildings that we live in, the cars that we drive, the books we read to our children, even the way that we think? I'm Alistair Souk, and I earn a living writing about art. And in this series, I'm going to explore the life and work of four titans of the 20th century. Henri Matisse, Pablo Picasso, Salvador Dali and Andy Warhol. They all changed their world. But have they changed ours? This week, Andy Warhol. These are some of the most famous, valuable and controversial works of art ever made. For many, they epitomise all that they detest about modern art. This one is a lurid, distorted picture of a film star. There are more than 20 versions. Just one of them sold recently for $28 million. And the artist didn't even paint it by himself. That artist, Andy Warhol, is as famous and controversial as the images he created. Warhol predicted that, in the future, everyone will be famous for 15 minutes, and then spent his life making it come true, exploiting the media to transform himself and his eccentric, beautiful entourage into celebrities. Some even say that he heralded the consumer-led, celebrity-driven world we live in today. His influence really does seem to be everywhere, from reality TV to Facebook to magazines, even to the way that music's performed. And his images are incredibly familiar. After all, Andy Warhol's the man who painted Campbell's Tomato Soup and also canonised the movie star Marilyn Monroe. But just because his work is so widely reproduced and he's so incredibly famous, does that mean that he's actually any good? I'm going to try and find the answer. My first stop is the O2 Arena in London. Good or bad, Warhol's art is worth a fortune today. This box arrived at the O2, carrying one of his works about to go on show before being auctioned. It's a portrait of Michael Jackson, made by Warhol in 1984. It bears all the hallmarks of a classic Warhol. It's a print with brush strokes of paint layered on top, based not on Jackson himself, but on a photo of him. Warhol simplifies everything. Detail is replaced by strong, garish colours. It's almost cartoon-like. And it both reduces Jackson's face to a mask, but also fixes it forever in a burst of colour. The work can still pull in the crowds. So what is it about Andy Warhol and his art that continues to fascinate so many? The new, rebranded Andy Warhol was now ready to face the world, and his next artistic venture would bring him all the attention he craved. So after soup cans and Coke bottles, what did Andy do next to really shake up the art world? He put on a show that looked, well, it looked pretty much like this. Andy transformed a really ritzy, upscale New York gallery basically into a supermarket and filled it with Brillo boxes, cartons of apple juice and packets of cornflakes. It was about as far from traditional painting on a wall as art could get. For the show, he printed plywood replicas of the original cardboard boxes. Some thought it a brilliantly ironic comment on art and modern consumer culture. Many others thought it was ridiculous and quite possibly a fraud. The strange interviews Andy gave didn't really clarify the situation. The uh, Canadian government spokesman said that your art could not be described as original sculpture. Would you agree with that? Ah, uh, yes. Why do you agree? Well, because it's not original. 
You have just been copied, a common uh, item. Yes. Well, why have you bothered to do that? Why not create something new? Uh, because it's easier to do. It was the start of the Andy persona. Not just the wig and the glasses, but his weird deadpan manner. It was a strange way to make yourself famous, but it actually worked. The more mysterious and enigmatic that Andy was, the more people were drawn to him. Well, isn't this sort of a joke, then, that you're playing on the public? Uh, no. It gives me something to do. Andy's flippant manner and infuriating answers unleashed a storm in the art world and beyond. But his supporters believed he was doing something important, questioning the need for art to be original, arguing that it was the idea behind an artwork that mattered, and not necessarily the skill used to make it. Andy's Brillo boxes were brash, irreverent, and mass-produced, just like the modern world he saw around him. To reinforce his rejection of craft and originality in his art, Andy started calling his studio the factory. He removed himself almost completely from the hands-on creation of his work, increasingly using an industrial process he discovered in the early 1960s called silkscreen printing. To assist him, Andy brought in an expert printer, Gerard Malanga. I'm going to meet up with him. He brought you on board because you were an expert in silk screening. Correct, yes. Why was it such a perfect technique for him? What drew well, you to it? Well, when you look at a silk screen print, whether it's on paper or on canvas, what you're actually looking at is a painted photograph. This was a natural development from the blotted line technique that Andy had used as a commercial artist. But silk screen printing was an industrial process mainly used for creating wallpaper. It was perfect for making mass-produced art about a mass-produced world. Okay, that, that's good. Gerard's going to show me how to make a silkscreen self-portrait in true Andy style. He would say, oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> we said that about everything. We place our blank silkscreen covered in emulsion over the blown-up photograph and expose it to light. Oh, it's quite heavy. And then I have to turn on the vacuum. Yeah, that. It transfers the image in reverse okay. onto the screen. Okay. All right, so now we have a stencil, uh, which is a negative of the positive acetate. Yeah, I see. And then when you put ink through it... it you recreate the positive image. Take the top off the, the yeah. ink. I've got to be careful not to spill it everywhere. All right. Just like this. Yeah, that's fine. A little bit more. Yeah. Okay, now get your squeegee. Sweep it real fast. Okay. Keep going. The technique allows the artist to build up multiple layers of colour, transforming the original photograph into something new, showing us how the artist sees the subject. So let's see what I've done. Wow. Wow, look how perfect that is. Well, it's not bad it's for first perfect. attempt. It's too perfect. So, Gerard, number two, this is yeah. still wet. So you think Andy would have liked that? Oh, yeah. Okay. These are call, I used to call more. these the divine accidents. Oh, and he, he sort of went with that idea, that it just doesn't matter. I look like a pink mouse with lipstick. I'm not sure I like it very much. No, no, but there's less pink. You see, there's more pink in that. This is okay. I like this much better than this one. The silkscreen process became Andy's trademark. It allowed him to create some of the most recognisable images in the world. Mick Jagger. Jackie Onassis, his cow wallpaper, Chairman Mao, and Marilyn. These are images that are never going to go away. The 